Hello and welcome. Today let's go through and let's talk about cellular respiration. This will take us through chapter 7, but before we begin chapter 7, we want to do a little bit of a we want to cover a little bit of information from chapter 6 and then we'll jump back to 7. Now the information we're going to cover in chapter 6 is going to be information in regards to energy. So let's talk about energy. Now, before we jump in, here I would like you to know when we go into cellular respiration and talk about chapter 7, cellular respiration is going to be the release of energy from molecules such as glucose. The release of energy, cellular respiration is the release of energy from molecules such as glucose. Now, these processes that are going to make up cellular respiration these processes are going to use energy to help form energy, right? It's like uh, they say in investing, in order to make money, you have to invest money. So that's kind of like the same concept that we have going on here. Now, when we talk about energy, I would like you to know energy is the ability to do work or bring about a change. It's the ability to do work or to bring about a change. In order to maintain their organization and carry out metabolic activities, our cells, as well as organisms in general, need a constant supply of energy. This energy allows things to carry on the processes of life, which will include growth, development, metabolism, and reproduction. Life on Earth is dependent on solar energy. Photosynthesis, we're going to get into after 7, is going to provide nutrients for the majority of other organisms. Now, when we talk energy, I would like you to know energy occurs in two forms. Energy occurs in two forms. You have, number one, kinetic energy, and number two, potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy in motion. It is the energy in motion. For example, as when a ball rolls down a hill, that's energy in motion. Or let's say uh, somebody jogging, somebody riding a bicycle, their legs are exhibiting Kinetic energy, that's energy in motion. Next thing we have potential energy. Now when we talk potential energy, potential energy is stored energy. It is stored energy. Potential energy is energy that has the capacity to accomplish work, but it is not being used at the moment. So it has the potential to bring about change. For example, food that we eat has potential energy because it can be converted into kinetic energy. Now, when we go through and we talk then, potential energy, so potential energy you can think of as somebody who's sitting down. Their legs now have potential energy in them. If we were to tell them, hey, can you get up and run a couple of laps, right? They would say, no, I need extra credit. If you give me extra credit, maybe then I'll go and do it, right? So um, their potential energy can allow them to get up and run a couple of laps, right? Or if we talk about a dam, right, dam holding water back, if that water starts to come down, we could use that energy that's going to get formed to power, uh, you know, people's lights and give them energy. Now, when we talk energy, we have two types of energy. We have chemical energy, which is going to be energy that's stored in chemical bonds. And we have mechanical energy. And we have mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is going to be energy of motion, as in walking. That is mechanical energy. When we go through and we talk about muscle contraction, skeletal muscle contraction, we'll see, is going to help convert chemical energy, which is going to be ATP, for example, 
into actual directed energy where I'm going to actually move objects. Here we can see the two laws of thermodynamics. Here we can see the flow of energy in an ecosystem can be explained by two laws of thermodynamics. Number one, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be changed from one form to another. That's a law of conservation of energy. Explains that further. Energy cannot be changed from one form to another without a loss of usable energy. That's 100% right also. Next then, let's talk about metabolism. I would like you to know when we talk metabolism, metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. When we talk breaking down and, or building up molecules, we refer to those processes as catabolism and anabolism. Now, when we talk catabolism, catabolism is talking about the breaking down of molecules. For example, if we make proteins, we have proteins, we break them down, we break them down into amino acids. Or if we talk anabolism, anabolism talks about building molecules. So that's where you talk about actually getting amino acids and putting them together and building proteins. So here, when we talk chemical reactions, we can see in a chemical reaction, it's made up of two parts. You've got reactants, which here are A and B. And then here we have our products, which are C and D then. Reactants, I'd like you to know, are going to be the substance that are going to enter, that participate in the reaction. The products are going to be the substances that are going to be produced. These are the substances that are going to form. So the products are going to be substances that are formed as a result of the reaction. Next then here you can see when we talk free energy, free energy then is going to be defined as the amount of energy that is available. The amount of energy that is available. Next then let's move over to talking about ATP. Now, when we talk about ATP, first, I would like you to know that ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Stands for adenosine triphosphate. ATP is energy for our cells, as you can see here. It is the common energy currency for our cells. ATP has a cousin, GTP, that's also a type of currency, but ATP is the common energy currency for cells. Now, when we talk ATP, ATP is a carrier of energy you can think of, or the energy currency as we defined of cells. Now, ATP is generated from ADP, which is known as adenosine diphosphate. So triphosphate and diphosphate. You should kind of already start thinking of the difference. A phosphate here tri three di two, so there's a difference of a phosphate here. ATP is generated from ADP, so triphosphate. Oh, we can make ATP from ADP. Very good. How? By the addition of an inorganic phosphate molecule. So if we add a phosphate to ADP, right? That makes sense. Then it becomes ATP. So instead of having two phosphates, we add another one. You get three then. So ATP is generated from ADP. ATP is a nucleotide that's composed of the nitrogen-containing base called adenine. It is composed of the nitrogen-containing base called adenine and also the 5-carbon sugar ribose and 3-phosphate groups. So when we talk about the structure of ATP, it's made up of the nitrogen-containing base called adenine, number one. Number two, a five-carbon sugar called ribose. Number three, three phosphates, three phosphate groups. That's ATP. So ADP, everything the same except for two phosphate groups instead of three, right? Makes sense? Next then, you'll see as glucose is broken down, energy is going to be released. 
This energy then is used to produce ATP. When we break down one glucose molecule, the breakdown of one glucose molecule is going to result in about 36 to 38 ATP. It results in about 36 to 38 ATP molecules. So here we can see our ATP molecule. ATP is going to be an unstable molecule and has high potential energy, especially in between these bonds here and here higher in here compared to here. So here we can see our adenine, our ribose, and we've got our three phosphates. When this ATP molecule gives up its phosphate and helps to power something, it will become then ADP, we said, right? So then we'll have adenosine diphosphate formed. So we can say once ATP undergoes an exergonic reaction, ADP is formed. And here you can see the phosphate is released. But then we said we can form an ATP by adding a phosphate to an ADP. So here when we talk about the creation of an ATP from ADP, we're talking about our ADP undergoing endergonic reaction, forming ATP. So if we get ADP and we add a phosphate to it, we'll have an ATP formed. So exergonic and endergonic reactions. Now this energy, ATP, can be used to do lots of different things. Okay, and we'll go through, we'll check that out. So ATP structure, we've talked about there. All right, phosphate energy is stored in these chemical bonds. The three phosphates. So we talked functions of ATP. So here we can come and see the various functions of ATP. Then we talk ATP, the energy in the ATP can be used for most cellular reactions, such as building up macromolecules, transporting, moving substances across the cell membrane, and even mechanical work. Cilia to contract, flagella to beat, right? Muscles to contract, ATP, thanks to ATP. So let's move to chapter seven. Now here we'll talk cellular respiration again. We define cellular respiration as the release of energy from molecules such as glucose, accompanied by the use of this energy to synthesize ATP molecules. Now when we talk cellular respiration, if we have aerobic cellular respiration take place, we'll see it's going to require oxygen and it's going to give off carbon dioxide. Along with that, we're going to see, we said 36 to 38 ATP form, and also you can see six water, and six water are going to be formed. Now, when we move through and we talk cellular respiration, you no know, glucose is a high energy molecule, and as it is broken down, energy gets released, and then this energy is going to be used to produce ATP. Again, as we mentioned, the breakdown of one glucose molecule is going to result in 36 to 38 ATP. Now, the pathways, the pathways that make up cellular respiration are going to allow the energy within a glucose molecule to be released slowly for ATP synthesis. Now, before we jump in, I'd like to talk to you guys about NAD plus and FAD. NAD and FAD are going to be coenzymes. Cellular respiration involves many individual reactions. Each one is going to be catalyzed by its own enzyme. And again, typically proteins we saw when we talked about their functions, they behaved as catalysts. Some of these enzymes use coenzymes. NAD plus, as we can see here, stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And we have FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide. I like to think of them as Uber or Lyft or whatever you want to call it. What does Uber and Lyft do? They taxis, they pick up people from one place and they drop them off at another. Well, here what they do is they're going to be picking up electrons from one place, hydrogens basically, and dropping them off at the electron transport chain. So when we talk 
NAD and FAD, they're going to be electron carriers. When the two accept electrons, each carries two electrons and two hydrogen atoms. Now here we can see when NAD plus picks up two hydrogens, which consists of two electrons and two hydrogen atoms, it undergoes reduction. And it is going to form for us, we can see here, NADH plus a hydrogen atom. Now when this NADH plus this hydrogen atom undergoes oxidation, it basically loses those two hydrogens. It loses those two electrons and hydrogen atoms. And you can see here, to form NAD+. When is which going to happen? Well, we'll see the reduction is going to happen in glycolysis and in the transitional phase and in Krebs. Now, this oxidation of NADH plus hydrogen is going to happen, we'll see, at the electron transport chain because then these NADs are recycled. We have a limited supply, so they get recycled, and we'll see cellular respiration is not going to be able to occur unless we have enough of these NAD pluses there. So when we talk NAD plus, NAD plus, you can see when it picks up two hydrogens, it undergoes reduction to form NADH plus a hydrogen atom. Now FAD, FAD, I would like you to know, when FAD is going to undergo reduction, FAD is not going to become FADH plus H. FAD, okay, when we add two hydrogens to it, it's going to become FADH2. F A D H two. Next then. Now these shuttle buses, these taxis, these Ubers, whatever you want to call them. They're going to do what their job is, and that's to ferry or shuttle these electrons. So they'll take these electrons from the cytoplasm and also from the matrix of the mitochondria, and they'll take them to the cristae of the mitochondria where the electron transport chain is going to be found located. After they have dropped off their electrons at this electron transport chain, they're going to go back and pick up more electrons. So we said that they get recycled. Now here we can see the phases of cellular respiration. When we talk about the phases of cellular respiration, the phases include glycolysis, the preparatory reaction or the transitional phase. Then we've got citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle. And then the electron transport chain. Let's go through. So when we talk glycolysis, Glycolysis, I'd like you to know, is the breakdown of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, where we're going to see glucose of molecule get broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. That's what glycolysis is. So that's one phase of cellular respiration, as we can see. So we're going to see oxidation occur. Oxidation is going to occur by the removal of electrons and hydrogen ions, and this is going to provide the energy for the immediate buildup of two ATP. So here in glycolysis, we see two ATP formed. Then we enter into the preparatory reaction. When we talk about the preparatory reaction, in the preparatory reaction, we're going to see our pyruvate is going to be oxidized to form acetyl-CoA, and one carbon is lost, and the carbon is going to be released as carbon dioxide. One three-carbon molecule becomes one two-carbon molecule then. The prep reaction occurs two times because how many pyruvates did we form? Two pyruvates. So you have to remember that. So when we talk then citric acid cycle, the citric acid cycle is a cyclical series of oxidation reactions that are going to produce one ATP and two carbon dioxide per turn. And then we said we had two. So two pyruvates, they're going to become acetyl-CoA and then they're going to give rise to two ATPs and then we're going to see four carbon dioxide molecules. 
So here acetyl-CoA gets converted to citric acid, and then it enters the cycle. Citric acid cycle is going to turn twice, right? We said because two acetyl-CoAs are produced per one glucose. And then finally, the electron transport chain. It's a series of electron carrier molecules. And the electrons are going to be passed from one carrier to another. And as they're moving from one carrier to another, these electrons are losing energy. So as the electrons move from a higher energy state, from right when they enter the electron transport chain, to a lower state, when they're completing the electron transport chain, energy is going to be released to make ATP. Under aerobic conditions, 32 to 34 ATP per glucose molecule are going to be produced. We said before 36 to 38. Here, why we're decreasing it? Because some of the energy is going to be used to help move our NADH from the cytoplasm uh, into the mitochondria. So some gets released there. And so that's what we have going on there. So as long as you can remember, you've got 30 plus ATP, you are perfectly fine. Here we can see glycolysis, where glucose is going to get converted to pyruvate, and our NADH is going to be moved. So that requires energy. That's going to require energy. And then here we're going to see the preparatory reaction in eukaryotic cells. It takes place inside the mitochondria. Here then we're going to see NADH produced also. And here we've got the citric acid cycle we said in the mitochondria. And here we've got the electron transport chain also in the mitochondria. But here are different parts. The matrix is where citric acid cycle occurs, we said. And then the cristae is where we're going to find the electron transport chains on these cristae. So here we can see the electrons, they come in as high energy electrons and they bounce from carrier to carrier, energizing these carriers, right? Giving their energy off to the carriers, energizing them, and then they becoming themselves low energy electrons. And when they give their energy off to the carriers, that energy is going to be used to help synthesize ATP. Pyruvate formation. So pivotal metabolite in cellular respiration. Why? Because if there's no oxygen available, that pyruvate in animals is going to form lactate. In plants, it forms alcohol and carbon dioxide. And it's a process called fermentation. Fermentation. Fermentation results in a net gain of 2 ATP glucose. That's it. So it's not the most efficient. So we want to have oxygen available. We want aerobic. We call this anaerobic respiration. Let's talk then first glycolysis, the first phase. The first phase glycolysis takes place, again I'm telling you, is takes place outside the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. Takes place outside the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. Glycolysis does not require oxygen. It does not require oxygen. So it can happen whether or not oxygen is present. But when we get to pyruvate, that's where oxygen is going to be important. So therefore, we call glycolysis an anaerobic process. It is anaerobic. The other phases, the other phases take place inside the mitochondria, and they are aerobic, meaning they require oxygen. Glycolysis is going to be the breakdown of a glucose molecule. It's the breakdown of a glucose molecule. One glucose molecule is chemically written as C6H12O6. So it's a six carbon molecule. It's going to get broken down into two, three carbon molecules. It gets broken down into two three carbon molecules, two pyruvate molecules. Pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. Glucose is a six carbon molecule. So when we talk about the phases of glycolysis, we have energy investment steps that take place here. And then we're also going to see some energy harvesting steps here as well. In the investment steps, Two molecules of ATP are going to be used to activate glucose as glycolysis is going to begin. And then in our energy harvesting steps, we're going to see the oxidation of G3P result in NADH synthesis. Additional chemical changes are going to lead to direct 
substrate level phosphorylation where we talk about the formation of 4 ATP. But if we were to subtract the amount we invested, you can see here then, we really have a gain of only 2 ATP because 2 were used to activate the glucose. So that's the investment, right? When you make money, you don't say, oh, I made this total sum. Right? You take out what you invested first to see what you actually made. All right, next, so I'd like you to learn and understand the terms oxidation and reduction. So now I want you to see via oxidation, and when I use the term oxidation, in relation to metabolic reactions, oxidation, it represents a loss of electrons. And reduction, reduction is the gain of electrons. So we'll see via oxidation in the reaction sodium plus chloride, for example, Na plus Cl. Na is going to be oxidized. Na is the element that is oxidized. It loses electrons. And chlorine, chlorine is going to be reduced. Our chlorine electron is going to be reduced. It will gain electrons. So again, so via oxidation, by the removal of electrons and hydrogen ions, this phase is going to provide enough energy to build two immediate ATP as we described. Now during the preparatory reaction, during the prep phase, so here we can see glycolysis and the cytoplasm, okay, produce two, we had a net gain of two ATP. We did produce four, however, two were used in the investment and then we have a net gain of two. Now during the preparatory phase, pyruvate we said is going to get oxidized to a two carbon acetyl group, to a two carbon acetyl group, which is going to be carried by coenzyme A2, Krebs cycle. Because glycolysis ends with two molecules of pyruvate, the prep reaction we said occurs twice per glucose molecule. Next then is a citric acid cycle. Citric acid cycle we said is a cyclical series of oxidation reactions that are going to produce one ATP, that produce one ATP. But again, the citric acid cycle turns twice because two acetyl-CoA molecules enter the cycle per glucose molecule. So altogether, this cycle will add two immediate ATP molecules per glucose. Next, then, you finally have the electron transport chain. This is a series of membrane-bound carriers that pass electrons from one carrier to another. And then we said high-energy electrons are going to be delivered to the chain, but they're going to leave as low-energy electrons. But they will leave as low-energy electrons, as we saw right in here. The electron transport chain is like a flight of stairs. You can think of it as a ball bouncing down that stairs as it loses potential energy. So as electrons pass through the carriers, energy is going to be released and used for, we said, ATP synthesis. The electrons from one glucose molecule passing down the electron transport chain can yield or produce a maximum of 32 to 34 ATP depending on certain conditions. Pyruvate is a pivotal metabolite in cellular respiration. Now, if oxygen is not available, we said, to the cell, fermentation is going to take place. And fermentation is going to happen inside the cytoplasm instead of continuing to aerobic cellular respiration. As glycolysis begins, we're going to see two ATP molecules are going to be used to activate our glucose and eventually help create two three-carbon molecules. So we are going to transform one six-carbon molecule into two three-carbon molecules. Let's look at all of this then step by step. So let's move right down here. Let's skip all of these slides here and let's go right to this slide right in here. This slide now gives us all the 10 steps that I want you to know about in relation to glycolysis. Here, they're just giving abbreviations 
and not really giving the full story. So let's talk about the full story and we'll see the full story right inside of here. And once you understand it from here, then you'll see all of this is much simpler to understand. So here we're going to see right when glucose enters the cell, glucose is going to get phosphorylated. Glucose will get phosphorylated by an ATP molecule. ATP comes in and it phosphorylates glucose. When we say it phosphorylates, we say that it gives up one phosphate to glucose. So if ATP gives up one phosphate to glucose, ATP is going to become now, very good, ADP. And our glucose, since it picked up a phosphate, now becomes glucose. 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose and 6-phosphate is telling us on which number carbon, because all these carbons that you see here, they're all numbered. So here you have carbon number 1, carbon number 2, carbon number 3, carbon number 4, carbon number 5, and carbon number 6. So they're telling us glucose after being phosphorylated by ATP forms glucose 6-phosphate. Then this glucose 6-phosphate is going to rearrange itself, and when it rearranges itself, it's going to become fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate. Now fructose 6-phosphate then? Now fructose 6-phosphate will get phosphorylated also. It gets phosphorylated by ATP, ATP becoming ADP, and our fructose 6-phosphate now becoming fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6, because now we have a phosphate on carbon number 1, and we still have that one on number 6. Since there's two of them, bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And here you can see the two phosphates. Now this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it is going to be split. It's going to be cleaved is the proper term, but I'll tell you it's going to be split. It gets split, so it's a six carbon structure. It's going to get split into two three carbon structures. Those two three carbon structures are G3P, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate gets cut in the middle to make two G3P molecules. Technically speaking, it makes one dihydroxyacetone phosphate and it makes one G3P. That DHAP, it transforms into G3P. So that's why we say when this gets split, it gets split into two three carbon molecules, which are basically two G3P molecules, which are two G3P molecules. You can see each of them has a phosphate. So let's jump back now. Let's go to your book. You can see in your book they're showing you that. They're showing you glucose. Glucose gets acted on by two ATP molecules. Eventually having both phosphates attached to it. This is the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then it splits into two G3Ps. So one, two. And then that's what you're seeing right in here. One G3P, and then we said the other one becomes a G3P also. So we have two G3Ps. This is where we're at now. So then you can see we continue forward. There's still more steps. So now since we have two G3Ps, right? Let me mark that right here for you guys. Keep everything in order. So we have, I'm going to put a one here, and I'll put a two here. Just think of this as G3P. Okay, G, 3, P. So we have two G, 3 Ps. Let's put this one here on hold. Tell this one, hey, buddy, you hang out, wait up for a minute. Let's take care of this one here first. So we're going to get this G, 3 P. And this G, 3 P now, you can see, is going to get oxidized. It gets oxidized. NAD plus comes in and an inorganic phosphate comes in. NAD plus comes in and gets reduced. So NAD becomes reduced, forming NADH plus H. And now our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to become 1,3-bisphosphate. 
phosphoglycerate. It becomes 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. You see down here. Open up an empty presentation and look at it from there. So 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is formed. Now you can see 1,3-bisphospho. Again, two phosphates on there. Now 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate now. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate underwent oxidation and it became phosphorylated. Now we have the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate formed. Now our 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to give up one of its phosphates. This is a substrate level phosphorylation reaction taking place here. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to now become 3-phosphoglycerate, and you can see here, one ATP molecule is formed. Our 3-phosphoglycerate then undergoes changes to become 2-phosphoglycerate. The 2-phosphoglycerate undergoes changes to become phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP. And then phosphoenolpyruvate undergoes substrate-level phosphorylation reaction as well, helping to form an ATP molecule. And then PEP becomes pyruvate. We had another G3P molecule sitting here. So it undergoes the exact same steps. You see now why we have four ATP produced? Because the first G3P came and produced two. Now the second G3P coming in is going to produce two more. That's why we have four, but then we subtract the two we use to activate glucose. So that's why we have a net gain of two ATP, we said. And how many reduced NAD pluses? We have one from this first G3P, and then we have another one from the second G3P. So we get a total of four ATPs minus two, that's a net gain of two ATPs, and two NADH plus hydrogen ions. So let's look at back here. It brought us to G3Ps. Right, so we split the two molecules, and now each of those molecules, as we showed, are going to undergo their own steps. So eventually you can see G3P becoming BPG, bisphosphoglycerate. 1, 3, is, this should be 1, 3, BPG. 1, 3, BPG, 1, 3, bisphosphoglycerate, that's what we had right here. 1, 3, bisphosphoglycerate. And then coming back. Our 1,3 BPGs that we've made are going to become 3 PGs, right? And an ATP is formed. So that happened. And then 3 PG becomes 2 PG, and then PEP, and then pyruvate, where the next two ATP are formed. So I want you to know it like we see here. So now when we move to the outside of the mitochondria, and we talk fermentation, outside the mitochondria, if you want complete breakdown of glucose, this breakdown will require an input of oxygen to keep the electron transport chain working. If oxygen is limited then, if oxygen is limited, cells can utilize the anaerobic pathways, such as fermentation. In humans, the pyruvate formed by glycolysis, it accepts two hydrogen ions and two electrons, and it gets reduced to lactate. It gets reduced to lactate or lactic acid. And only two ATP get produced. Other types of organisms instead produce alcohol. Other types of organisms instead produce alcohol with the release of CO2, like yeast. So advantages and disadvantages of fermentation. Fermentation is essential to humans since it can provide a rapid burst of ATP. However, you'll see in working muscles, in muscles working vigorously over a short period, fermentation is used to produce ATP as oxygen is going to be limited. Lactate is toxic to cells. So when we replenish the oxygen, lactate gets converted back to pyruvate. As lactic acid accumulates, 
Lactate, lactic acid, it changes the pH of our muscle cells, causing then that burning feeling that we get. So fermentation then yields only 2 ATP. Now those 2 ATP represent a very small fraction of potential energy stored in the glucose. Right? In cellular respiration, 36 to 38 ATP molecules are going to be produced. Therefore, most of the potential energy stored in glucose has not been released when we talk fermentation. So with fermentation only, a net gain of 2 ATP. So here you could see then pyruvate will go and become alcohol if we're talking plants and yeast. Okay, if we're talking animals, goes on to become lactate. Right, the NADHs, the electrons that we extracted, they're going to be used. So then we move to the inside of the mitochondria. We'll see the final reactions of cellular respiration, which will include the preparatory reaction, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, all occur within the mitochondria. All occur within the mitochondria. When we talk about the preparatory reaction, the preparatory reaction is going to take place inside the mitochondria it will produce the molecule that will enter the citric acid cycle. In this reaction, our 3-carbon pyruvate is going to get converted to a 2-carbon acetyl group. The carbon we lose from here is going to be lost as carbon dioxide. So we say pyruvate undergoes decarboxylation. Pyruvate also undergoes oxidation to lose electrons to NAD+, plus, which becomes reduced to form NADH plus a hydrogen ion. Also, we'll see a coenzyme. Coenzyme A is going to come in and attach to the acetyl group, forming for us then acetyl coenzyme A, acetyl CoA. Now, we have to remember this happens twice. So since it happens twice, pyruvates are going to form two carbon dioxides and two reduced NAD pluses and two acetyl-CoAs. So let's look at that right inside of here. Acetyl group attached to coenzyme A to become acetyl-CoA. Carbon dioxide produced and hydrogen atoms are going to be removed from pyruvate and they're picked up by NAD, NAD plus to form NADH plus, this hydrogen ion. And this reaction, remember, is going to happen twice. That's why we said two carbon dioxide, two NADH plus H, and two acetyl-CoA. So here you can see two pyruvates plus two coenzyme A's, two NAD pluses coming in to become reduced, two pyruvates becoming oxidized, and then here you can see two acetyl-CoAs and two carbon dioxides are formed. Next, let's jump to the citric acid cycle. Now, when we talk citric acid cycle, the citric acid cycle is located in the matrix, located in the matrix of the mitochondria. At the start, the two-carbon acetyl-CoA carried by the coenzyme A joins with, now you can see, a four carbon molecule, which is called oxaloacetate. And now when the two come together, this four carbon molecule and the two carbon molecule, they produce a six carbon molecule called citrate. The coenzyme A is gonna be recycled to the preparatory reaction. Each two carbon acetyl group is gonna be oxidized to two carbon dioxide molecules. Now, reactions here in the citric acid cycle. Now, we move to the citric acid cycle. Now, here you're going to see each two-carbon acetyl group is going to get oxidized to eventually produce two carbon dioxide molecules. Each one. So, that's going to be a, four, a total of four carbon dioxide molecules. Reactions are going to produce three NADHs, right, and one FADH2. So, in here, we've got two from directly from citric acid cycle and one from the prep. So that's why there's three NADHs. One came from the prep reaction, and two will come from citric acid cycle. 
and then one FADH2. But then remember, we have two acetyl-CoA. So we're going to have a total of six NADHs and two FADH2s. One ATP is produced by substrate level ATP synthesis. But remember, there's two. But remember, there's two acetyl-CoA. So we're going to have two. Cycle turns twice per glucose molecule. So remember that. Cycle turns twice. So everything you look at in here, you have to double that. And here's the inputs and the outputs. Again, nice summary. So let's look at this citric acid cycle. So we said a two-carbon acetyl-CoA is going to come in and join a four-carbon oxaloacetate molecule, forming for us then citrate, six-carbon molecule. Citrate then is going to undergo decarboxylation and oxidation, reducing an NAD+, plus, forming NADH+, plus hydrogen ion, liberating carbon dioxide, and forming a five-carbon molecule. Five-carbon molecule. This is called alpha-ketoglutarate. Next then, this five-carbon molecule, we'll see, will also undergo decarboxylation and oxidation. Here you can see then it will form a four-carbon molecule. Also reducing NAD+, plus, we said, giving rise to NADH plus H, and a carbon dioxide. Our four-carbon molecule is formed. Now this four-carbon molecule is going to undergo substrate-level phosphorylation and produce one ATP for us producing one ATP. Now this four carbon molecule also undergoes, you can see oxidation, reducing FAD, forming FADH2. So the next four carbon molecule that we have formed then also undergoes oxidation, reducing NAD+, giving rise to NADH+, hydrogen ion, forming for us then again our four carbon molecule that we started with. You see why we call this a cycle? You start with what you end with. Remember the cycle happens twice. Happens twice. So if we look at the products that are going to be produced, since a cycle is going to occur twice, the final products are going to be four CO2 molecules, so two we have right here, and then two more, and then we can see six NADHs, one, two, three, and then this happens twice, so six NADHs, and two FADH2s, along with that, two ATP, two ATP. Next then is our electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is located on the cristae of the mitochondria. Located in the cristae of the mitochondria. And this electron transport chain, listen to the name. It's a series of carriers that pass electrons from one to the other. Series of carriers that pass electrons from one to the other. Some of these electron carriers, some of the electron carriers of this system are called cytochrome molecules. They are iron-containing proteins. Cytochromes are a class of iron-containing proteins. Now, when NADH gives up its two electrons to the chain, NADH is going to become NAD+. And the two hydrogen ions will remain. Similarly, when FADH2 gives up the two electrons to the chain, it becomes FAD, and both get recycled. Each carrier becomes reduced and then oxidized as the electrons move down the system. As the electrons pass from one carrier to the next, Energy that will be used to produce ATP molecules is going to get captured and stored as a hydrogen ion gradient. So let's look at that. So here you can see then 
they're showing these electron carriers as these electrons bounce from carrier to carrier, they're going to eventually help make ATP, make energy. Let's look at it in greater detail. So first, here you can appreciate the mitochondria. So make sure if you didn't understand the mitochondria before, you've got it down fully now here. So here we can see the cristae. They are invaginations of the inner membrane. So here we're going to see, we said, as the electrons pass from one carrier to the next, energy that will be used to produce ATP molecules is going to get captured and stored as a hydrogen ion gradient. Get stored as a hydrogen ion gradient. So here you can see that. Here we're going to dump all of these hydrogens that we have here. We're going to dump them off over to this side right here. And that's where then you can see we're creating our hydrogen ion gradient. We're going to have more on this side compared to this side. And you've seen we have diffusion that takes place whenever we have when we have a higher quantity of a substance on one side of a permeable membrane compared to the other side. Oxygen receives the energy spent electrons from the last carrier. It combines them with the electrons, creating a charged molecule that attracts hydrogens, forming H2O, forming water. The complexes in the cristae, they use energy released by electrons as they move down the electron transport chain to pump hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into the space between the outer and the inner membrane, called the inner membrane space. Now this pumping of these hydrogen ions this pumping of these hydrogen ions, it creates an unequal distribution of hydrogen ions. The cristae, you can see they also contain this ATP synthase complex. This ATP synthase complex, which is going to allow hydrogen ions then to flow through them so they can make their way back into the matrix. The flow of hydrogen ions through an ATP synthase complex brings a change in its shape. It creates a change in its shape. The shape change is going to cause this enzyme ATP synthase. It will cause this ATP synthase to synthesize ATP from ADPs. It causes the enzyme ATP synthase to synthesize ATP, you can see here, from ADP and phosphates that are just hanging around. Now this process here is called chemiosmosis. It's called chemiosmosis and it indicates ATP production is, is tied to an electrochemical gradient. Specifically, the unequal distribution of hydrogen ions across the cristae. Now once formed, ATP then is free to pass through and make its way into the cytoplasm. So once formed, our ATP molecules are going to be able to pass to the cytoplasm. They're going to be able to pass through to the cytoplasm. So next then let's move and we can see then all of the processes again in greater detail. We can see then all of the processes here. So glucose, undergoing glycolysis, then the prep reaction, citric acid cycle, and then all our NADHs that got formed from there, that got formed from them, make their way over to the electron transport chain to help form then 36 to 38 ATP. 
So when we talk about the efficiency of cellular respiration, you can see this is not really an efficient system. Only 36 to 38 ATP we said are produced. And here you can see it has a 39% efficiency of energy capture. The rest of the energy is going to be lost as heat. It gets lost as heat. Here we can see now what we have done is we've gone through, we've talked about all the different steps with carbohydrates, glucose, right? All the way down this way. But I'd like you to know that, but I'd like you to know proteins and fats can also yield energy when needed. And proteins can do that by either becoming pyruvate or acetyl-CoA or, en or entering Krebs cycle. Fats, they get broken down to glycerol and fatty acids. Glycerol can go and convert to eventually pyruvate, and fatty acids can get converted to acetyl-CoA. All right, so real quick, we'll do one review over electron transport chain before we completely take everything away. So here again, we can appreciate that electron transport chain. So here we could see basically everything along with the mitochondria there. What we'll do is we'll move to the picture one back so we can appreciate everything in detail. So here now we can see all of our NADHs, and we have FADH2s here. Our NADH plus the hydrogen ion and FADH2s, we said are going to get shuttled to the electron transport chain. So here now what happens is NADH plus this hydrogen ion is going to give up its electrons to protein complex number one. It gives up its electrons to protein complex number one. Protein complex number one is going to grab those electrons and it's going to start basically moving them down. FADH2 it cannot, it cannot give its electrons to protein complex one. It can only give them up to protein complex number two. So FADH2 gives them up. So now these electrons, they get dumped off from FADH and NADH, and they're going to start bouncing from carrier to carrier to carrier, eventually making their way over to, we said, oxygen. So here, as these electrons bounce from carrier to carrier to carrier, we said that they're going to be energizing these carriers. They give up their energy to these protein carriers. Now the hydrogens now, we can see those hydrogen ions, they're all going to be found here within that matrix. So once these protein carriers are charged up, what happens is they're going to be able to pump these hydrogen ions over to that intermembrane space. So when they start pumping all these hydrogen ions over to the intermembrane space, you can see here now they are hydrogen ions. So what they're doing is they're creating a gradient. Number one, they're hydrogen ions, I was saying. They're protons. They're contributing to the acidity of a solution we mentioned. So that environment out there is going to become really acidic. And a concentration gradient because we're going to have more hydrogens on one side compared to the other side. So what happens then is we have these protons on one side of the semi-permeable membrane and they're going to tend to diffuse across as long as we have an opening there for them. So the opening then is going to be our ATP synthase, complex number five. So here then is where we saw these protons, they are able to make their way over back into the matrix. And as they start to make their way back into the matrix, we said it causes a shape change to happen in this protein, which allows then the ADP and the phosphates to come together, forming then ATP. So just a quick summary of what we can see there. And then Krebs cycle, we saw it was a cycle. So you have to go through and know what's happening here. And then glycolysis. We saw a beautiful picture here of glycolysis. All right, we've covered everything then. Perfect, perfect. Awesome.